Part two, we're going to talk now a little bit about some of the interpretation techniques and how you interpret seismic data. It's really a, a concept that it's an iterative loop. We start out with an observation, we look at the data, determine what we can see, is the data good, is the data bad, um, what do we see in the data, then we make an interpretation. We get our pencils out if we're dealing with paper or we use our little mouse on the workstation and we make an interpretation. Then, sometime during this process, we've formulated a, a conceptual model of what we think the geology looks like in this area. We test the interpretation against that model, make revisions to it, and then loop through the process again. We observe to see if our model meets what we came up with on the interpretation. If it doesn't, we erase, back up, try again, and cycle through it until we come to a point where we're relatively comfortable with what we see in the seismic data, the interpretation we've made, and that matches fairly well with the model that we've come up with. Um, most people nowadays work on workstations, so I want to talk a little bit about techniques that we use to make interpretations on workstations. And some of the things that we need to think about are, is the data of sufficient quality? Does it need to be reprocessed? In other words, can I work with this data set as it is, or do I need to send it out and have it reprocessed so that hopefully we can improve the quality of the data? When I'm dealing with the workstation, I've got some questions I need to ask there. I can do a couple things to interpret the data on a workstation. I can pick the events manually, or I can use the auto picker. So the first thing I have to determine is can I use the auto picker, or am I going to have to use manual picking? Um, and that's driven a lot by the quality of the data. It's driven also a lot by how faulted up the data is, how continuous are my reflectors. So in some places in the data set, I may be able to use the auto picker quite well and cover a lot of ground with it. And in other spots, I may have to use just the, the manual picking itself. Um, and those are some of the things you have to answer. So what am I trying to do? Well, one is I'm looking with, at how and with what confidence can I correlate my data? Do I, can I correlate across the seismic line really well with good confidence that my picks are, are where I think they should be? Or is there some ambiguity and I'm having to, to really make some decisions there? The next thing I need to do is, is how many horizons do I map? Usually there's only one or two that I'm actually interested in, but I really need to map more horizons to be able to make a good interpretation. For instance, I may want to know when the structure formed. In order to do that, I have to map horizons above and below the zone that I'm interested in so I can look at whether the bed thickens or thins over my structure. And then finally, the last thing I really need to, to answer is can I meet the objectives of my study with this data set. In other words, am I just looking to map structure? I can get by with a less robust data set, but if I'm trying to extract rock property information, the data may have not been acquired in a manner that will let me do that. So I have to be able to make that determination as well. First thing you want to do when you start out interpreting a seismic line is you want to look at the top, up near the surface. You want to look for things like near surface channels. Do I have near surface amplitude anomalies? Both of those will affect how my data looks in the subsurface. Remember, we're working in time and not depth, so that if I have a unit up shallow that has a low velocity in it due to the presence of gas, every event under that is going to sag and will look like a structural low when it may in fact be a structural high. So I want to look for things that can alter my data set. One of the things that, that's done in processing is what's called statics corrections and these are corrections that are made on the seismic line to account for differences in elevation. If I'm dealing with onshore data, I've got a weathering zone that may thicken and thin as I move across the line. I have to correct for that. Otherwise, a nice flat event in the subsurface will roller coaster, which is not what it really looks like. So I'm looking for things in my seismic data set that will cause those. And one of the things the processor will do is do a statics correction. And I'm looking to see if that was done correctly. And generally that'll manifest itself in the fact that I'll see vertical 
things in my seismic data where the event may come along and jump straight up. Almost always if you see a vertical event seismically, it means there's a problem with the static. So you want to make sure you understand those. Do I have salt in my section? If I'm dealing with a salt dome basin, for example, salt has an extremely high velocity compared to other sediments. So if I have a thick lens of salt, everything under the salt is going to be pulled up. It's going to give me a false structure, so I want to be able to map, know where that is, so I can correct for that. And also, if I have a fault in the data set, areas under the fault become what's called a fault shadow, and the velocities are affected under there as well. So I want to make sure I see those. A couple of other things I need to observe is what's the horizontal scale and the vertical scale. Now, granted, the horizontal scale is in feet or meters and the vertical scale is in time, so they're not quite the same, but there is a relationship between those. In other words, if my scale is scrunched up this way and expanded this way, it'll distort the dip angle on faults within my data set, which can lead me to make some less than stellar interpretations. How's the data oriented? Is it up dip, down dip? Is it a strike line? In other words, is it running parallel to the bedding planes? Or is it uh, running perpendicular to dip? You want to look at the entire data set before you start interpreting. You're trying to decide, is the data really good enough for me to meet the objectives? Can I map it? Do I need to reprocess it? How much can I require the, use the auto picker? Uh, and then I want to look at variations across the data set. Some data sets are really nice in some parts, not so good in other parts, and I have to be able to decide where those are and come up with a method of how I'm going to handle that. The most important thing is the interpretation must fit the geology. We have to understand what's going on with the geology before we can make a, a realistic seismic interpretation. There's an infinite number of interpretations that can be made on the same data set. And if you give the same data set to five geoscientists, you'll get 10 or 15 different interpretations. And a lot of those are biased by where you spent your career working. If you've worked in the Rocky Mountains, for example, and have dealt with compressional geology your whole career, your tendency is to make every fault a, a reverse fault. If you've worked in the Gulf Coast, on the other hand, everything's a normal fault. And I've seen interpreters take the exact same data set and one of them will interpret every fault reverse. The next group will interpret it as a normal fault. Both interpretations look really good, taken on face value, but one of them doesn't fit what the regional geology is. Seismic interpretation at its basic level involves correlating two types of surfaces. We're either dealing with horizons or faults. We have to be able to determine the difference between the two and decide what they are. And let's start off. What, what is exactly is a horizon? Well, it's a surface separating two rock layers that gives rise to some type of seismic reflection because there's an acoustic impedance contrast. There's a velocity and density contrast before it. Uh, two types of physical surfaces we tend to see that are, give these to us. One is a straddle surface, that's a bedding plane, a depositional surface. The other one is an unconformity, and that's an erosional surface where we've got missing section. We see them both on seismic data, and both can cause a reflection if there's sufficient impedance contrast there. The next thing we have to decide is, is it a fault? Well, what is a fault? Well, a fault is a displacement of rocks along a shear zone different types of faults. We can have normal faults, we can have reverse faults, we can have strike slip or wrench faults. So we have to be able to recognize that one, that they're a fault, and two, what type of fault they are. How do we recognize them on seismic data? Well, horizons are recognized by correlating and tracking continuous changes in the patterns of reflections. They tend to be more horizontal or sub-horizontal in nature, whereas faults are primarily based on recognizing discontinuous patterns in the surface, or bed offsets. Sometimes we can get a continuous reflector off a fault plane as well if there's sufficient velocity contrast between the upthrown and downthrown blobs. We'll actually get a reflector off the fault plane itself. When we're dealing with faults, bedding is relatively straightforward to interpret. You find a horizon, you track it 
horizontally or across the data set. Faults, on the other hand, we have other issues we have to deal with. One, we have to cor interpret them on the seismic section, but then if we've got more than one seismic section, we have to be able to track the fault from seismic section to seismic section. And we need to be able to accurately correlate across the faults, which is sometimes easier said than done. In this case, there's an example here where I've got a seismic event typed in red, colored in red here, and I have a yellow fault. And then you go down thrown to the fault. Does the pick go here or does it go down here? Well, if we look at pattern recognition, I see I've got these three events here. I see the same three events down here. So pattern recognition tells me that that event that I see here on the upthrown side should go here on the downthrown. One of the techniques we use to help us do interpretation is, is a concept called common dip families. And what we're looking at is a series of events that have commonality to them. Uh, and we're looking for basically boundaries between common dip families. So if you've got a family dipping like this and another family dipping like this, then I know I have a boundary between those two common dip families. One of the things we need to do is establish a geologic model to get there. We have to understand whether we're dealing in depositional environments that are deltaic, for example. Are they up on the shelf? Are they off in the the slope or basin? Are we dealing with carbonates and reef buildups? And then we want to be able to associate those depositional patterns with that geologic model. Once we make that, then we need to test it. So we want to ask the question, what is it? Can you recognize it in the geology? Is it a fault or nonconformity? In other words, can I put a name to it? And then where is it? Can I delineate it in time and space? So can I track it across the data set and make it fit into an understandable geologic concept? In this case, I've got a seismic section here, an event coming across here, and the question you want to determine, well, is it a fault or nonconformity surface? Well, some of the clues we can use is we see we have events lapping up onto that event from below and events that are truncated on it from below, which tells me, based on my geology, that that's an unconformity surface and not a fault. Then the next thing we have to do with our seismic data is determine which features we see on it are real and can be correlated and which are not, particularly when we're dealing with 2D seismic data we tend to see things like side swipe, and these are reflectors that are coming from out of the plane of the section that are coming across our data set. We see multiples, which is a repeat of some event when you're working offshore in particular. The water bottom reflector is a very strong reflector, and it tends to go down, back up, hit the surface of the water-air interface, and come back down again. And we see that same event repeated over and over and over in the data set. Makes a really nice reflector but it bears nothing in reality. So we want to make sure we understand what those are and be able to understand the difference.